This video is part two of the introductory Art of the Italian Renaissance lecture. I left at the point where I introduced the major periods we will be studying this semester, the early and high Renaissance, which are bookended by the style of the Trecento and Mannerism. This course will move forward chronologically, although there may be exceptions for thematic progressions. Therefore, I suggest getting a handle on the chronology and the major distinctions between periods. Although we will have to go back to the Trecento, or 1300s, in the next class to start our chronology at the beginning, we will now look at broad developments, primarily occurring after 1400, in order to give a more thorough definition of the Renaissance itself and to see the Renaissance movement as a whole before we look at the parts. Let's start with the political context. There are three major trends. First is the militaristic expansion of the Islamic Ottoman Empire in the East, which probably has the most significant impact on the Renaissance movement as a whole, but particularly in the movement's early development. Another trend was the birth of modern nation states in the West, such as Spain, France, and England. This trend had little bearing on Italy, which was still divided into fiercely independent political territories, typically under the rule of a noble family, and more specifically, the leading member of that family, often titled as a duke. Finally, we should remember that the European discovery of the American continents began with Columbus's first voyage to the Caribbean in 1492. A closer look at the geopolitical situation in Europe indicates how politics may affect art. Notably, the Duchy of Milan under the Visconti family is at its apogee, and its expansionist policy will set it in direct conflict with Florence, the birthplace of the Renaissance. The territory of Venice is smaller at the outset of the 1400s, but it is on the brink of rapid expansion in the coming century. The Byzantine Empire, which is the name for the medieval Greek Empire that followed Rome's collapse in 476, has splintered into small Greek states as the Ottomans push westward, overtaking more and more territory. Meanwhile, the Black Plague of the mid-14th century had important socioeconomic effects that, despite the terrible loss of life and suffering, were not necessarily bad. As the society, with its population decimated, restructured itself, it turned out that a large number of people enjoyed an unprecedented standard of living. There was more work, fewer mouths to feed, etc. Due to having fewer available hands, an increasing mechanization of work also occurred with significant technical innovations. Finally, in the face of this great catastrophe where the church could offer little practical help, there was a weakening of the church's vice-like social grip that destroyed the spiritual unity of the Christians and arguably opened channels to explore earthly or human-centered pursuits. But why did the Renaissance start specifically in Florence? To start to answer that complex question, we should remember that Florence is not a duchy, but rather a republic with economic power and independence of spirit. The Florentines saw their city as the new Athens and developed a myth that Florence was the successor to the ancient Roman Republic, two analogies that harken back to classical antiquity. The Florentines had a unique sense of civic pride, a sense of libertas, or liberty, against oppressive tyrannies. This civic pride nourished, and was in turn nourished by, an intellectual impulse towards humanism based on the model of antiquity. Since, unlike the medieval societies, the antique cultures promoted the endeavors, the worth, and the unique ingenuity of human beings, rather than allowing religious dogma to limit their intellectual scope or spirituality to limit their pursuit of earthly pleasures. This zeitgeist, or mood of the times, led to an artistic program, or publicly sponsored art, that included, first, the 1401 contest for the baptistry doors in Florence, second, the sculptural decoration for the Florentine Cathedral and the Orsan Michele Church, 
and third, a robust attempt to engineer a giant cupola for the Florentine Cathedral, Santa Maria del Fiore, which had proved technically impossible up to that time. But why were the Florentines celebrating a sense of libertas at this moment? And how did they come by antique models for their ideas of liberty? And why is humanism the result of it all? Let us first deal with libertas. The idea of libertas was born from the threat of the Duchy of Milan. Florence, technically a republic at this time, self-styled as a state of liberty in direct opposition to the tyrannical state of Milan under Duke Gian Galeazzo di Visconti, two early humanist scholars and political leaders of Florence referenced antique texts and models when trying to galvanize the Florentines against the invading forces. In other words, ostensibly more democratic antique political systems were being touted to muster troops and political monetary support for those troops. After the initial threat from Milan, more threats continued, so encouraging this notion of Florentine liberty against tyrannical opponents would remain strong. But all in all, the Florentines securely consolidated their position of power in central Italy. As noted, antiquity serves perhaps merely as a pragmatic model for liberty. But how did the Florentines, specifically and Italians in general, gain better access to these Greek and Roman cultural models? The rediscovery of antiquity was largely born of the threat of the Ottoman Turks. This is because, as the Ottomans pushed into the west, the Greeks fled even further west, to Italy, and brought not only certain antique texts that had been lost in the west, but also, being native Greek speakers, an academic familiarity with the ancient Greek language that would enable interested Italian scholars to read the texts in their original versions rather than in translation. This is what led to the Renaissance development of philology and humanism. Now, just to be clear we're on the same page, I'll give some definitions. Philology is not just the study of ancient literary texts, but the study of the language itself in which those texts were written. Humanism has two definitions. The first refers very specifically to the scholarly movement that happened during the Renaissance and that describes the expansion of the scholarly curriculum, specifically to include history, the Greek language, moral philosophy, and poetry, along with the more traditional fields of grammar and rhetoric. Humanism in a more general sense means, as we have already noted, the emphasis on human worth and potential to attain excellence rather than divinity alone. This was certainly a trend during the Renaissance, but writers of the Renaissance period referring to humanism are largely referring to a scholarly curriculum revived from antiquity. Either way, you can't talk about the Renaissance without talking about both the scholarly movement and the more general movement, although the more general definition of humanism applies more directly to our study of the visual arts. Thus, it could be argued that the propagation of Greek studies was a direct effect of the political situation. Byzantine Greece was battered by the Ottomans for at least 60 years before the city of Constantinople, which had been founded by the Greeks in the 7th century BC and was thus centuries older than such ancient Italian cities as Florence and Venice, finally fell in 1453. With a Greek population that was over 2,000 years old, the city, unlike Athens and other mainland Greek cities, never returned to Greek rule. It should be noted that, in an era when territorial conquest was commonplace and borders fluctuated constantly, so many Greeks fled from Constantinople and other Greek cities because of what I will somewhat offhandedly call a kind of culture shock. Religion hovers over every aspect of life in the Middle Ages, and Europe is defined by its Christianity. The Ottoman Turks were Muslim, and this makes the conquest of Greek territory unique, and it explains the great exodus from these lands. 
an exodus that arguably gave us the Renaissance. Another major factor promoting humanism in the Republic of Florence was its economic prosperity under an oligarchy of high middle class background. With this, you should keep in mind that the concept of libertas formed a political ideology with respect to strong foreign powers, but the oligarchy in power conceded no sense of personal equality or political equality to lower class citizens within this so-called republic. Various families vied for positions of power, but the 15th century would be defined by the republic's control by the de' Medici family. As early as the 13th century, monasteries ceased to be the major cultural centers. Instead, throughout Italy, the princely and seigneurial courts, as well as the cities themselves, became the intellectual centers. This is where humanism flourished, both in Florence and in other Italian states, including Mantua, Ferrara, and others. Although innovation and art particularly flourished in the Republic of Florence due to this middle-class oligarchy, which fostered a competitive spirit of corporate powers and favored artistic merit rather than sheer favoritism of princes. The increasing study and understanding of antiquity also increasingly put contemporary Italians in direct competition with antiquity for its achievements. I usually ask my students if they can guess what the importance of this is from a Christian perspective, but the answer is simply that as the Italians became aware of the greatness of classical antiquity, and by greatness I mean things like unmistakable technical achievements that the medieval population had been incapable of perpetuating, never mind the literary or artistic accomplishments, they were faced with a problem. How could the Christian era be less great than a pagan or non-Christian era? It is thus that they felt compelled not just to emulate antiquity, but indeed to surpass it. Another general note on the Renaissance that I want you to be aware of is the changing role of the arts and the artist. Filippo Villani, a humanist, writer, and historian from Perugia, made the first explicit declaration demanding a place for the visual arts among the liberal arts, defined by their purely intellectual aspect versus an idea about the mechanical arts. This was around 1400. It's thus that today you study art in a college or university and take art history classes like this one rather than attend a technical school or undergo an apprenticeship, for better or worse. But you should be aware of how this elevates the status of the artist at that time, a theme which we will revisit throughout the semester. So, we've seen how humanism influenced and was intertwined with the artistic programs and early achievements in Florence, a trend that really extends to Renaissance art in general. But what defines Renaissance art? Here, I've listed some elements that characterize the Renaissance artist's new approach. The discovery and use of linear perspective, the discovery and use of aerial perspective and the sfumato technique, as well as a return to the modeling of 2D figures through the use of light and shadow, the search for perfect proportions, whether in the entire composition or in individual figures within a composition, the profound study of the human figure, applied also as a kind of rule or measurement of beauty and perfection, and the study of nature. Attention to the individual, whether in physiognomy and anatomy or in the representation of emotions, and the repudiation of decorative elements and a return to what is essential. That makes the art clear and simple. These elements, once again, are fed by and feed the larger Renaissance cultural trends of humanism and the rediscovery and emulation of antiquity. Together, this approach and these elements generate the general pictorial characteristics in the subject matter of Renaissance painting, as well as its means of production and its criticism. 
The general pictorial approach is fairly classical, blending naturalism with an idealism that results in images of great beauty, balance, and harmony. The repertoire of artistic themes is expanded to include subject matter that is not religious and eventually even pagan. As the artist gains more status, art history is born, with figures such as Vasari, who recorded the biographies of the outstanding artists from the Trecento to his own time in the 1500s. We can end by taking a slightly closer look at the main periods of study and the progression towards the typical impeccable naturalism and perfectly harmonious and balanced compositions that really culminate in the high renaissance. Of course, the first steps are made in the Trecento when Giotto, in particular, initiates a more naturalistic approach to painting. And so we will begin with the Trecento and Giotto in the next class.